Welcome. Today we will be taking a look at the notes worksheet entitled Probability Day 3. This is where we get to see a variation of probability that coincides with the binomial theorem. So let's go ahead and do an investigation to get us thinking about it, and then I will go ahead and put a few things together. So the investigation is flipping a coin, and really we're talking about two outcomes, binomial, by bi being two. And so let's go ahead and walk ourselves through A through C, and then the key thing here, everybody, is going to be letter D. So let's even put a little asterisk by that immediately. Okay, so it says uh, for letter A, what is the probability of flipping a coin and landing on heads? Well, of course, guys, just uh, one heads, two sides, one half. Perfect. Now, everyone, let's take a look at letter B. What is the probability of flipping two coins and both landing on heads? So this is the probability of getting heads on the first coin and probability of getting heads on the second coin. And means multiply. So we would do this as one-half times one-half. And I'll just write a few things down here to get us thinking about it in a couple different directions. But basically, that would be one-half squared. And of course, then that probability is going to be one-fourth. So the probability that the first coin is heads times the probability that the second coin is heads. All right, very nicely done. Now letter C. Let's up the ante a little bit more here. It says, what is the probability of flipping three coins and all landing on heads? So if I kind of look at it, the probability of the first coin landing on heads is one half. And the probability of the second one being heads, so and being multiply, one half. And of course, then the probability that the third coin, coin lands on heads, that would be one half. And again, I'll go ahead and just represent that in a slightly different way, as we will see this variation emerge in a little while here. So hope everybody would be in agreement. That would be one half to the third in this case. And so the probability that three coins go up and they all land on heads would be one out of eight. All right. So we have that scenario taken care of. Obviously, I can continue this. Um, you know, one coin, two coins, three coins, all heads. But now, let's go ahead and take a look at a different type of outcome and see what, um, see what we want to do with it. So letter D. It says, what is the probability of flipping three coins and two landing on heads here? All right, so first of all, notice what I wrote off to the side there. We're going to have to be a little careful about this. So rather than just kind of looking at it as, all right, three coins, two landing on heads, and thinking about, okay, what's the probability of getting a heads, and then probability of getting a heads, and then probability of getting tails, because that would be two heads and, th and one tails, um, we have to think about it in a slightly different context. So guys, I broke it down just a little bit with a few probing questions here. Let's see if we can put this together now. So here's the key. In how many ways can two heads actually occur on the three coins? This is the main difference between letter D and then especially letters B and C from above. So how many ways can two heads occur on the three coins? Well, we have seen this before. And if you remember, we thought of this as a combination. So three coins, how many ways can we get two heads from three coins? This is going to be 3C2. So if you remember that piece, we kind of looked at this exact situation before, two heads and three coins. And we'll go ahead and list those momentarily just so you can really see it in action. But let me go ahead and get that going from up here. So 3C2, and if you notice, 3C2 is 3. So at this point, basically what this is saying is there are different ways that you can get this outcome. In fact, there are three different ways that you can get this outcome. Okay, well, let's list them. Just so you, if you're not convinced about this situation right here, um, let's go ahead and list them. So you can get heads on the first coin, heads on the second coin, and tails on the third coin. That would be one way that this can occur. What's another way that you can get two heads on three coins? Well, you can get heads on the first coin, tails on the second coin, and heads on the third coin. That's the second way. What's the third way that this can occur? Well, you can get tails on the first coin, heads on the second, and heads on the third. And so if you look at it here, everyone, there are three different ways that this outcome can occur. 
And so as a result, it's not quite as simple as just taking the probability of one thing happening times the probability of another times the probability of another because there are multiple ways that those probabilities can occur. Okay. So let's go into that next piece, of course. Um, first and foremost, it just says each way has a probability of, and I guess this is where we want to kind of talk about it up here, this would be this piece, everybody. So each way has a probability of one-half times one-half times one-half. However we slice it here, everyone, the probability of getting two heads and, and one tail is just one way that we can do that. Well, guys, probability of getting a head is one-half. Probability of getting another head is one-half. Probability of getting a tail is one-half. So each way is going to be one-half to the third. Okay. So now we answer the original question. And so in this particular case, here's how I would write it. And this hopefully will look familiar as the next part is going to sort of allude to. But there, guys, is our 3C2 three different ways that this, this probability can occur. And so it's the probability, well, let me get this right. So there are three ways that this can occur. And basically what we have is the probability that we get a heads is one half. The probability that we get tails, I'm sorry, another heads is one half. And the probability that we get tails is one half. And so here is probability of a heads, heads, and tails. And we multiply that probability by three because there are three different ways that that can happen. I'm going to go ahead and just bring this up here because we're going to write it in a slightly different way. And then I'll ask you if it does look familiar. But here's our 3C2, everybody. Here would be the probability of getting our two heads. And here's the probability of getting tails. And guys, look at that formation right there. We have this coefficient, so to speak, out in front, the number of ways something can happen. Then we have one probability raised to a particular power, and a second probability also raised to a particular power. Well, guys, does that look familiar? And I'm hoping that, it, that you see that it does, if you kind of remember the binomial theorem. Each term in a binomial expansion has this piece right here, our little uh, NCR right out in front right here, and then one term raised to a power, and a second term raised to a power. And this is what is called binomial distribution, and that's exactly the variation of probability that we're going to take a look at here today. All right, so if you're still not convinced on this, that's okay. Don't worry about it. But the idea being is there are different ways that this outcome can occur. So what we would do is take the probabilities, like we have been doing, one times the other times the other, but then we have to multiply that by the number of ways that it can happen. And that was this piece out here. Okay. Well, let's give a try to, well, actually, let me just define one or two things quickly here, and then we'll go ahead and uh, do a couple calculations. So at the top of uh, my board, it says binomial distribution and probability occurs. And here's what you're going to write in there for me, please. When there are, and this shouldn't be a shocker, two outcomes. And the way we're going to refer to these outcomes, everybody, would be success and failure. And we'll kind of describe that as we go through the process there, of course. So when there are two outcomes, success and failure, and very simply, the terms in a binomial expansion, and that's the idea, guys. We're finally seeing a, a nice application of the binomial theorem. In this case, it goes with the probability. So in a binomial expansion, so those terms give the respective probabilities. All right, so make sure you get this piece down for me, if you would. And then again, we'll take a look at, I think I've got three examples for you. So in this case, probabilities of, you know, zero successes, one success, two success, all the way up to N successes. 
All right, so if that looks like a whole bunch of verbal jargon at this point, that's all right. Kind of jot it in there, and then we'll go ahead and take a look at it in action. All right, so I have an example one that just really is, is very basic to start it out here. And uh, we'll go ahead and do it a couple different ways, and then we'll go ahead and do examples two and three that uh, should hopefully solidify some of these ideas. All right, guys, let's take a look at example one. It says, determine the probability of flipping six coins and having four land on heads. Calculate your answer in two different ways. All right, so we, we've done a problem just like this before, and there is probably a, a more straight up approach to this, and so I'm going to start with that piece. But then we'll go ahead and do the binomial expansion version in just a little bit. So in terms of um, just a, a straight up fraction here, favorable outcomes and possible outcomes here, Again, we've kind of talked about this piece before, but essentially uh, six coins going up, and each one of those has two different outcomes on it. So in this case, the, the denominator here, and I'm hoping you would all agree with this, is going to be 64, just two to the sixth. The first coin has two outcomes, the second coin has two outcomes, the third coin, et cetera, et cetera. So each of the six coins has two outcomes, and as a result, um, there are 64 total outcomes there, just fundamental counting principle, no big deal. All right. Now the top, again, kind of goes into actually what I said before, is how many ways are there to get four heads on those six coins? Well, again, we've kind of seen this scenario occur where we have six coins, and how many different ways can we get four heads on those six coins? And what we determine is it is a combination. And so it would be 6C4 like that. And if we do this right here, I have it on my sheet, so I'm just going to let it ride at this point. Um, obviously, I already mentioned that's 64. And I believe that 6C4, if you did that on the calculator, would be 15. And that's great. No big deal right there. And, and again, we've kind of done a problem like that, and it works out just fine for something like this. Well, what I'd like to do is try this binomial way and see if we can come up with that same 15 over 64. Okay, and it works great here. It, unfortunately, this situation, and probably more efficient on this problem, unfortunately will probably not work for like the example two or the example three that you see. Okay, so let's give this a try, and, and here's how you're going to do it. We're going to talk about it as, you know, when I flip these coins in the air, there are only two outcomes, and so two outcomes has the potential to fit this binomial distribution. And so we're going to call the probability of success as getting heads and the probability of failure as getting tails. So it's black and white here, one or the other. The outcomes we're looking for is to get heads, and so as a result, we're going to call the probability of success heads. And on each coin, and that's what we want to narrow it down to. On each coin, the probability of success is exactly one half. The probability of flipping a coin in the air and having it land on heads is exactly one out of two. All right, good. Now I come over here, and if the probability of getting heads on a particular coin is the success, well, the probability of getting tails on a particular coin is the failure. And the probability of a failure on any particular coin is one out of two. All right, perfect. And so guys, here's how we're going to set it up. So basically, we want four heads and two tails. I hope everybody agrees with that. In order for this to occur, if you read the problem, determine the probability of flipping six coins and having four land on heads. So what that means is when the six coins go up, four land on heads and two land on tails. So what we want to do is kind of outline it I'm going to do it a lengthy way initially just for a moment, and then we'll kind of bring that in and, uh, and see if we can tie this together a little bit. Okay, well guys, what is the probability that each coin lands on heads? What's the probability of success? Well, in this case, as we already determined, the probability of each coin landing on heads is one half. And to answer this problem, we need four of those, right? We need four landing on heads. 
So that would be the probability of one coin landing on heads and another coin landing on heads and another and another. So I hope you would agree it would be one half times one half times one half times one half. That would be for the probability of getting four heads. Okay, good. And again, we kind of talked about this before as I interpret this problem, it's four heads and two tails. Well, what's the probability that each coin, um, well, that we would get tails on each coin? One half. And in this scenario here, we wanted four heads and we did want two tails. So the probability that one is a tails and times the probability that a second one is tails. And that's it. This is four heads, two tails. There's only one thing missing though. There are different ways that we can get four heads and two tails when those six coins go up. You know, for example, um, you know, as, as I kind of look at it in order, maybe the first four can be heads. Maybe the last four can be heads. Maybe they vary through, uh, throughout the, the six coins. There are different ways that we can get four heads on six coins. And guys, that's that piece right up here. How many ways can we get four heads from six coins? And the notation that we saw when we did the binomial theorem is that right there. And so what you end up having is coefficient, and then, of course, one raised to a particular power, and then a second probability raised to a particular power. Okay, and that's how it's going to play out. So if I go ahead and do this piece, and I think I'll play it all out on the calculator there, and let's just see this in action. So uh, 6C4, I guess now I can actually make sure that I had that right from before. I said it was 15. So there we go. There's your 6C4. And then times 1 half raised to the fourth. And then times, of course, 1 half raised to the second. And I get that decimal right there. And if you know, we go ahead and let's actually do this, just kind of thinking about it. Let's turn that into a fraction. And there's our 15 over 64. Excellent. So you see, nice little binomial distribution. And you know, this calculation right here, if you really look at it, and it shouldn't be a great shock, is this calculation right over here. Here's your 2 to the 6th down on the bottom, by the way, and 1 to the 6th on top. And then here's your 64 multiplied in. All right, so this is going to be the format. This is what you're going to see. Two probabilities, one success, one failure. So we take the probability of success raised to however many times we want to see it, times the probability of failure raised to however many times we need to see it. But there are different ways that we can get those outcomes, and so we multiply it by the number of ways we can get it. All right, let's go for it. Example two. Todd Helton's career batting average is 327. What this means, everybody, is for every 1,000 at-bats, he gets a hit 327 times. That's what this means right here. This point three, uh, 327 is really 327 out of 1,000. In a game where he has five official at-bats, what is the probability that he gets two hits? All right, beautiful. So let's go ahead and talk about this piece right here, success failure. Either he's going to be successful and get a hit, or he's going to fail and not get a hit. So in this case, one or the other. There's no other option here. So probability of success, according to his statistics, would be 0.327. Every time he steps up, there is a 0.327 probability that he gets a hit, that he has success, so to speak. Okay, which means, of course, if that's the probability of success, then the probability of failure would be what we would call the complement, and so that would be a 0.673. This would be kind of a 32.7% chance, if you like that representation better, and so the probability of failure then would be 67.3%. Okay, one or the other. All right, so we get those two pieces going, and now what we want to do is, is talk about our our probability of five at-bats, so let's just see. Here we go, five at-bats, and essentially two successes. 
All right, so let's kind of talk about this. What we want is success, success, failure, failure, and failure. So two successes and three failures. And so what is the probability that each time he steps up is success? So guys, 0.327. How many successes do we want in this particular probability problem? We want two successes. And so we raise it to the second power. So probability of getting a hit times the probability of getting a hit. All right. Now, in order for this to occur, five at-bats and two hits, what that means, of course, is that he has two hits, but he also has three outs, three failures, so to speak. And so what's the probability that he fails in his at-bat? 0.673. How many failures would we see for this particular probability problem? We would see three. So this would be probability of getting an out times the probability of getting an out times the probability of getting an out. And as a result, as you can see right here, that would be raised to the third. And that looks beautiful. Sorry for being redundant, but there's only one thing missing. And the one thing that's missing is there are different ways that this can occur. There are different ways that he can get two hits in five at-bats. He can get uh, two hits the first time around, the second time around. Or he can get two hits maybe the last two times at-bat, or the first and the last. I mean, again, there are different ways that that can occur. Well, how many ways does that occur? Five at-bats, everybody. Two hits. Five C2. And so this, and you could see that binomial theorem perfectly formed right here. Here's our coefficient, the number of ways that this can occur, and in times the individual probabilities raised to their appropriate power. So let's go ahead and take a look. And so I get 5C2. I've got that one as 10. So if it's okay with you, I'm just going to go ahead and put in a 10 right there. So 10 times 0.327 raised to the second and times, what do we say there, 0.673 and that's going to be raised to the third. And there you go. So in any particular game, the probability that he has five official at-bats and two hits would be about a 32.6% chance. And that's what I'm going to write right here. 0.32, I think I saw 5.9 on that, so I'll stick with it. Okay. Not too bad. Not too bad at all. Let's go ahead and try one more good one. So example three. In the game of roulette, in, there are 38 spaces on a spinning wheel. If you uh, don't know roulette, maybe just do a quick Google on it just so you can get a visual of this, and then come on back. Otherwise, uh, let's just go ahead and let it ride here. But if you can visualize the, the spinning wheel here, there are 18 red spaces, 18 black spaces, and two green spaces. So my understanding is it should be 1 through 36, and um, 18 of those are odd, and 18, I'm sorry, 18 of those are red, and 18 of those are black. And then two greens, zero and double zero. So again, 38 spaces, one through 36, and then zero and double zero. So you're going to play conservatively. And what you can bet on, you know, there are obviously a ton of different variations of betting on roulette, but let's just go with the basic here. You're going to play conservatively, conservatively excuse me, and bet on either red or black for 10 spins. Okay. Good, so 10 straight up, you're going to do either red or black. And so let's talk about probability of success and the probability of failure. Now this is where Vegas gets you, of course, or how the uh, odds of this game are in the house's favor and not yours. The probability of success is actually not one half, even though that's how it's paid out. So the probability of, of winning is actually less than one half if you do it this way every time you spin the wheel. Because the probability would be if you do red, there are 18 reds. And again, if you do black, there are 18 blacks. You choose one of those, there are 18 favorable outcomes, but there are 38 outcomes on the, the wheel. And again, you get paid as if it's a 50-50 shot, but it's not. You can see it's 
you have a less than 50-50 uh, chance of, of winning. Okay, so anyway, the probability of success, 18 out of 38. Probability of failure then, there are actually 20 on there out of the 38. So again, it's a less than 50% chance of winning, even though that's how it's paid out. And that's how the house is uh, obviously in favor as, it, as you play. All right, well, let's take a look. So you're just going to go uh, 10 times. And I, I guess in order to be ahead, so just we'll say that you, you bet the same way every time here on, on each of the 10 spins. Um, in order to come out ahead, in order to come out with a profit, you would have to win six times. If you win five, again, theoretically, just um, you break even. So in order to come out ahead, you'd have to win six times. And so let's see, what would, what would be the probability of you winning six times? All right, so we have success, we have failure, and let's take a look at what's going on. So six successes and four failures. The probability of success is 18 out of 38. And we want success to occur six times out of the 10. So that would be the probability of success times the probability of success, et cetera, et cetera, for six times. All right, now in order for this to occur, in order to, for you to win six times, you have to lose four times. So the probability of failure is, is 20 out of 38, and this would occur four times. All right, beautiful. And that looks great. Six successes, four failures. We multiply the individual probabilities all the way across, and that looks really, really nice. The only thing that's missing, of course, is our number of ways that we can actually win six times out of ten. There are a variety of ways that that can occur, and of course, we do ten, C6. And there's your binomial distribution right there. And so let's go ahead and put that together. I'm going to go ahead and grab my calculator here and do the calculation. So I do 10, and let's go C6. I'll get an answer on that. So 210, and then I'm going to multiply that times. So the probability of success, we said, was 18 out of 38. And if we want six successes, um, we raise it to the sixth. And then, of course, times. And next thing, probability of failure. Oh, let me make sure I've got that right here. Is 20 divided by 38. And we would like four failures in this case. And there you go. So if you kind of look at this, what is the probability that you win exactly six times? And this would be kind of the first scenario where you would actually be able to gain a profit, it's only an 18% chance that you would win exactly six times. Okay, very nice. There's your binomial distribution in action. Now let's really see the binomial theorem one last time. So this was a little misleading. If you win six times, yeah, you've, you've gained a profit, you've won, you've beaten the house. But actually, if you kind of think about it, there are more ways that you can get a profit here and that's this last piece. Really, you will come out ahead if you win at least six times. At least. If you win six times or seven or eight or nine or ten times, um, you win. I mean, you, you've basically come out ahead. So what is the probability that you come out ahead in this case? And so here's what I would say, just kind of putting it this way. This would be the probability of six wins, or, or means add, probability of seven wins, or, again, you can win eight times. So what's the probability of winning eight times? Or you can win nine times. Or you can win ten. So to me, that's the scenario that we would be looking at for you to come out ahead against uh, the house here. And so what is this probability? Well, guys, watch this expansion right here. And it should look very, very familiar to the binomial theorem. So. I'm going to go ahead and play it out. I'm going to write all mine out here, and I, I have some stuff on my paper that I'll put in place. We already did this one, right? But I'm going to go ahead and rewrite this piece up here and obviously put that probability in, and then we'll go for it. So I'm going to need a little more board space, so just bear with me on it. But basically, six times would be 10C6. 
six wins, that means six successes, four failures. Each failure is that four times. So that is the probability that you would win exactly six times, plus the probability that we win seven times. Again, there are different ways that you can win seven times out of the 10 spins. So 10 C7, 18 out of 38. Now guys raise to the seventh because that would be seven successes and three failures. Something like that, right? And notice, watch it emerge. Same deal. How about eight wins? Well, there are that many ways that you can win eight times. And again, each of those would have an 18 out of 38 uh, chance of winning raised to the eighth because we want eight successes. And then, of course, that would mean two failures. Two more to go, and we've got it. How many ways can we win nine times? There you go, 10 C9. And then, again, this would be 18 out of 38 for each one of those time, uh, raised to the ninth. 20 out of 38, we would have just one failure. And then last but not least, how many ways can you win all 10 times? Well, there's only one way, of course. You've got to win all 10 times, 10 C10. 18 out of 38 raised to the 10th. That would be each probability of, of winning raised to the 10th, of course, for 10 different times. And if we win 10 times, obviously, we lose zero times. And, of course, we know anything to the zero is one. So you can see a lot of really interesting math all come together. Okay, I've got these individual probabilities rather than me grabbing the calculator and wasting our time on that. But you can really see, guys, do you see that application now of the binomial theorem? It looks really cool. And so as a result, I think when we did this one, we got 0 0.1820. Uh, to win seven times, there's only a 9.36% chance of winning seven times. And obviously, guys, you start to see the probabilities go down. So the probability of, of winning eight times is a little over 3%. So the probability of winning nine times, again, very unlikely to, to win nine times out of 10, just picking either red or black. And what's the probability of winning all 10 times? So guessing correctly all 10 times, well, I've got it as that probability right there. 0.06% chance of winning all 10 times. And so when I ask you something like, what is the probability that you win at least six, that would be beating the house essentially. Then um, here we go. We add those together. And so the probability of coming out on top would be about 31%. So you could see the probability of being even or um, being down is obviously quite a bit greater. <laughs> All right. Cool. Again, just an interesting variation. Uh, you know, the binomial theorem is definitely one of the more um, theoretical uh, discussions that we have, and so at least this is an interesting application of, of that binomial theorem within the context of probability. So try a couple out. See what you think. Hopefully I kind of laid out that investigation for you in a decent way, and then you can really see those terms in action. Kind of cool. All right. Well, again, when you try them out, let me know if something comes up, of course. Thanks for listening to it.